12 hours at Malem. This is a two player folio war game. It comes in a Ziploc bag and you will have to add your own dice and an opaque container. Other than that, uh, there's everything you need. So two player game, also a playable solo two handed, which is the way I played it. You play both sides at the best of your possibilities. And there are enough random and unpredictable factors here to keep you surprised and engaged all the time. The game simulates uh, the fight around the airport uh, at Crete during the German invasion in World War II. One side controls the Germans, the other side uh, defenders from New Zealand. And uh, there is a very unique uh, mechanism here. The general idea we have seen in other games, which is it's impulse-based. The players will alternate taking uh, impulses, which is basically a player turn, within a larger turn. Uh, the actions of the players will trigger a random end of the turn, so you do not know exactly how long each turn is going to be, or if uh, uh, everybody's going to be uh, allowed to activate. Most likely not. Most likely your forces will not uh, ac all activate every turn. And at the end of each turn you will advance to the time. The initial couple of turns so will have a special procedures because the Germans are landing. And so they will as they will take heavy fire, hopefully for the New Zealand player, and they will need to regroup and their capabilities will be reduced. Again, also you don't know exactly where they're gonna land, which is where where part of that unpredictability and solo ability of the game comes from. After a while, well, they landed, they regroup, and now just, they're just there pushing to, uh, towards certain objectives. So, uh, it's really neat. <laughs> the turn track actually represents, uh, looks like a clock and represents specific periods of time during the fight. And the idea is that the players are trying to perform actions that will affect when each side is ready to withdraw for the day. It's not a big retreat, uh, it's assumed that they will resume fighting the following day, but whoever withdraws first uh, that day loses the game. So there will be actions that will affect where the withdrawal markers for the two sides go. And so it's literally a countdown clock, it's a very thrilling situation because you really, you see the countdown actually happening around what is basically the turn track. And if the uh, turn marker reaches the withdrawal marker, one of the two sides, that side loses the game and the other side wins. If uh, by any reason the turn uh, marker meets, uh, reaches both withdrawal markers at the same time, then the game is a draw. And so uh, players again, uh, as, as the turn marker advances at a fairly unpredictable pace, players will try to affect how things go there. In particular, uh, the German player is trying to occupy locations on the board that will cause their marker to move away from the turn uh, marker and will push the marker of the, uh, of the ally player closer to the turn. Historically, the Allied commander didn't really have a good grasp of what was going on, so a major action for the Allied player will be to contact their own units, which gives them better uh, abilities, better uh, capabilities to move on the board, but also again affects that, boom, that marker positively. Also, elimination of German units, uh, which the Allied player is trying to perform well affect German withdrawal. So these are the main factors at play there. The map is printed on paper as you probably expect from a folio game and uh, this is a general view of it. See there are landing zones so at the beginning of the game during setup the German player will place these markers there that are associated with specific groups. So this is group 10 for example, this is a dummy so the player, the other player doesn't know that no one will actually show up there, not a dummy. I place them randomly as you can possibly tell. Units associated with group 7 will land there. And here you have a player aid, a player aid where the German player will place their units at the beginning of the game, again associating them. 
So now we reveal this marker, booyah, uh, seven, with seven. And so those are the units that now will go. Those are the units which we will place there that will land around that spot that was marked by that one. Again, by randomizing those uh, landing markers, I made the game uh, fair and predictable as a two-handed solo player. So that's where they will try to land, but we don't know exactly where they will land. There is a drift roll, so you roll two dice and you see where each unit in that group actually lands, so it will be around there. If you roll a 2, the German player chooses where that specific unit goes, and with a 12, the LA player chooses where the unit goes. So, in the early phases of the game, uh, also indicated by the different color band on the clock, uh, we're going to have a special procedure in which the uh, German units are landing, again, scattered around in weird ways. And as they land, they are also going to take a uh, regroup marker that goes on them with different numbers so that will replace temporarily the values of the unit. The unit just landed, boom, those are the values instead of the printed one. Of course, as they regroup, this is removed. These markers are all the double-sided later in the game. Uh, when the combat pins units down, you will draw a random one, place it on top of it, and now that affects, doesn't replace the capability, uh, the combat effectiveness of the unit. Speaking of that, sis, why don't we take a closer look at the units? They are, here we go, printed on cardboard. They're cardboard tokens. They are thick enough, good quality, a bit glossy, which, uh, why would I complain about that? Because uh, some of the stacks can get pretty tall in the early phases of the game, uh, even later if you have stacks of units that get pinned down, there's no maximum uh, limit, so sometimes units will stack up, and so you're going to have a unit and a pin marker and a unit and a pin marker, and maybe you have a cluster there. It can get a little crowded. So I don't know if the markers maybe should have been bigger or the hex is bigger. Either way, again, the glossiness makes some of those stacks a bit slippery. I'm nitpicking because the game is overall good, and I want to show you that I, I played it. I gave some thoughts uh, to the components. So... The units, uh, they have a main uh, numerical factor, which is their effectiveness, which is used both for combat and movement, that is their movement value, and then a tiny number there, not so tiny, good enough, indicating the range. Units with a white box around their combat effectiveness are able of direct fire. They're machine guns, mortars, artillery, and so there are advantages in that, in that you don't take the... Uh, the capability, the combat capability of the defender into account, but there may be limitations. For example, if they have the zigzag line there, they have limited fire capability. Once you fire them, they can't be spent, and then you either refit them or they or you or if they have a T there, they will go back to be combat capable at the end of the turn. Some units may have high weapons, uh, which pins down the opponent even better, instead of just drawing a random one. Uh, when you pin down the opponent, you draw two, if you're using heavy weapons, and you choose the worst one for the defender. And we have headquarters, so with that little flag there, and they have special capabilities, they give you bonuses. It's, it's headquarters, very useful, very useful. Oh, back to the map. So we have those objectives that I mentioned earlier that will affect the position of the withdrawal markers on the clock. Uh, we have these brown edges here that uh, indicate the areas where uh, ally groups are stuck at the beginning of the game until they are contacted through the headquarters. In um, action, and if the allied player contacts a certain group, you place the marker there, and now they can move out. Other than that, terrain uh, doesn't do anything. There isn't such a thing as a cover or things like that. I guess everybody's just so close to each other. The idea is that what affects a combat more than anybody, anything else, is support and and distance, support and distance. So. 
The map will be pretty crowded with the German units scattered everywhere with allied units starting from these areas. There is an allied group that can come from here. Uh, the Germans can also use these boxes to move a little, a little faster around this area. There will be groups that will land in these areas, <clears throat> German groups. But the German player will be pushing to uh, try to take control of those areas and the Allied player will try to uh, retain control for as long as possible and kill as many German troops as possible. That is the, one of the asymmetries of the game. During the impulse, you ch again, we alternate uh, taking impulses and we don't know when the turn is gonna end. Basically, if a six is rolled by anybody during fire resolution or during a refit action, that triggers the end of the impulse. So an impulse may be a single die roll. And maybe people wanna move a little bit before they start messing with that uh, thing, unless you want the game to end and then you start taking actions that will make you roll dice as much as possible. Movement is pretty simple. It is uh, take a unit and move it. I know, stunning. Well, you just move it by the number of, of hexes. I'm gonna place some units on the board kind of randomly to exemplify actually uh, later things, so to exemplify combat in particular. As you move, as you move, people fire at you. There is a mandatory, there is a mandatory, <clears throat> basically what in other games we call opportunity fire. Again, I'm placing units not necessarily where they should go, but where I want to place them. <coughs> So I can show them to you. When you move, when you move, boom, uh, in range of an enemy unit, they mandatorily fire at you. It's mandatory again because that may affect the end of the turn. Also, you can and if the unit is fired at but it's missed, it does is not affected, then the unit can keep moving. Otherwise, if it was pinned or hit, it has to stop. So <clears throat> there's gonna be fire during movement. And there's going to be a lot of it because everybody's closed the entire time. Uh, they, then also, as, a, as an impulse, you can choose to use fire. And in which case, you have the option of direct fire. If you have a unit that, again, has their, has their combat value printed in, the white, in a white box. Like so. I could choose an impulse and activate that one for direct fire. Or a uh, group fire, in which case I choose a lead unit and I can have a bonus based on how many supporting units are adjacent to it. So the general idea is this, you're going to take the cut for all of these kind of fires, you're going to take the <clears throat> actual value of the lead unit, whether it's reaction fire or group fire, you're going to add a bonus of plus one for each, for each um, supporting unit. And then you take into account other modifiers, and we have our trusty player aid here that shows us, for example, if you subtract the operational factor of the target unit, if it's reaction fire, you also subtract the uh, how much they move. The more they move, the, the better it is for the attacker, because they have been exposed for a while. So basically, if it's a group or defensive fire, you're gonna subtract the modified attack of the attackers. Sorry, the modified uh, factor of the defender subtracted from the modified uh, value of the attacker, and that will give you a total attack number. With direct fire, you start from the um, from the value of the attacker from the value of the attacker but you uh, do not take into account the value of the defender. There's still modifiers based, say, on, on distance, for example, or if the target is pinned. You will have an attack number then. Roll a die, cross-reference the result, and you'll see if the defender is hit, in which case it's flipped to its reduced side, if it's healthy and has two steps, or it is eliminated, if it is a one-step unit, or, uh, or it already took one hit. The unit may be pinned, in which case we draw these markers that will stop them on their tracks and also modify their values. It may be that the unit is pinned or hit if already pinned. And this is for combat. That's the general idea. Refit is when we get to replenish units that were 
that were uh, which we call them that uh, have fired and they needed that to go back on track uh, is also when we remove pin uh, things so we're gonna remove those regroup and pin markers at the end of the turn anyways and then there are headquarters headquarters actions which are different from the two sites again the allied HQs can spend actions to contact or try to contact their units the Germans can call in the Stukas uh, the allies can call the Matildas so different things that the two sides can do. We also have an initiative marker that switches from side to side and gives players the ability of re-rolling dice. But in general this is how you are gonna uh, play the game. Drop the Germans and in those early turns there are no HQ actions so drop the Germans, move and fire and in later turns move, fire, refit your units and possibly take headquarter units until one of both sides will withdraw. Snafu, the publisher of this game, continues to impress me. They may have just quickly become one of my favorite war game publishers. With their games that are easy to play, quick to play, they uh, they cover topics that are not obvious, they're not, they have not been over gamed, they really are effective. I like the production, the way the map looks, it's just stunning. Uh, the rule book, uh, it's good enough, maybe if, I don't know, I would have organized it slightly differently, such as by having uh, the rules about the landing before early in the manual, because you need to know those uh, before you know about the headquarter actions which are not allowed in the early turns anyway i guess it could have been more like a learn as you play set up the game and read the rules as you go but in any case it's very it's very serviceable and then gameplay feels very unique very different there are a lot of interesting things here that you don't see very often um but they really work. There is the yes, the randomness of the of the power drops. Uh, you don't know exactly where those German units are gonna go, and they look like they won't be able to do pretty much anything because the early turns are very painful for them. They just keep getting hit and hit and hit by by the uh, by the uh, allied units. But then they regroup, but then they start calling in the Stukas, and they are a lot of, there are a lot of things that happen. And ultimately, it is easier for them to, uh, to take control of things and move the markers, in my opinion. But then there are a lot of interesting dynamics there also when it comes to the way combat works, because it's very easy to uh, launch, uh, attempt a lot of attacks uh, at very low odds, with the column number one, number two, you have a unit that has a seven attacking a unit that has, that is a seven also, and maybe with the bonuses you get on the one or two column is a chance in six and a chance in three, or, or in, in, so it's not super great. Or you can spend more impulses to set up a mighty attack as you get rain, as as there's a rain of uh, uh, reaction fire coming against you. So you're taking your time, you set up your units, and sure, when you took a hit, now it's reduced, but I'm going to use that support only anyways. So there are a lot of trade-offs there between setting up attacks well at a risk and it takes time or go for lower odd attacks. And the fact that you have no idea when the turn is going to end uh, has huge impact. As the LA player, you really need to contact those units, perform that action. And maybe you're going to do that early on, but again, you don't know if uh, uh, the movement and, and fire of the opponent is going to trigger the end of the game, uh, the end of the turn. So you contact your units, which is so vital, but then you're not uh, launching some early attacks, you're not maneuvering units so that you're protecting uh, some uh, precious areas or vice versa. A lot, a lot of unique um, interactions and dynamics that you do not see very often in Wargaming because the action here is so spread out it's all over the map. You can't activate everybody every turn. You have to prioritize. You always get the sense that you should be doing more. There is something you're forgetting. Uh, you start 
uh, preparing an attack there and then something happens and you don't fully complete it and then oh gosh but other times you need to commit to certain areas like pin down that unit so we need to pile up there and 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 cut a hole in the line of defenders because otherwise uh, the end of the turn will arrive and they will regroup and they and they will lose the pin marker lot of interesting things and a constant sense of tension it's really i don't know many other uh, many other games that give you such a tangible sense of a countdown sure you may have a linear track and you know you need to accomplish something by turn 17 but somehow seeing it on a natural clock or representation of a clock, I don't know, it's very effective to me. So, 12 hours of Malem. I played it as a, as a Soiter game, playing both sides, and I really enjoyed it. I think the game works so well the way because between die rolls, uh, random, end of a turn, and the drifting German units at the beginning, you're going to have a lot of interesting things to think about even if you control both sides. Generally speaking, I found this game to be very effective and really fun to play.